This is the overview for ARC 331 and ARC 332, Architectural Structures 1 and 2. My name is Wayne Place and I am the professor in charge. This is my contact information. I encourage you to put it into your computers and cell phones so that you can get in touch with me easily. We will be using the forum on Moodle for many of our general purpose course related communications. More student specific communications can be handled using email, text messages, phone calls, or in person meetings. If you want to set up an in person meeting with me, the best way to do that is through email. Every Tuesday from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. I will be available in 212G Brooks Hall for course related matters. ARC 232 is a prerequisite to ARC 331, which is a prerequisite to ARC 332, which is a co-requisite to ARC 302, which is a technology studio which will follow up and expand on what you learn in these courses. To enter this course and work effectively, you should have a working knowledge of plane geometry, solid geometry, and arithmetic. You should have basic skills in sketching, doing scale drawings in a CAD program, and fashioning scale models out of cardboard, wood, plastic, and or metals. The course delivery will be online via Moodle, where you'll find over 130 videos, quizzes, tests, assignments that you can download and then upload your solutions, and a forum for discussions and communication. There are over 10,000 pages of technical resources that have been made available to us by industry groups and engineering societies for the purpose of this course. These resources have been distilled down and integrated into the textbook and the videos for our structures courses. We give thanks for the hundreds of thousands of hours that have been devoted to generating the knowledge base that allows us to efficiently design safe buildings. If we did not have these resources, we would either be paralyzed or move forward at great risk. The textbook for the course will be Architectural Structures, published by Wiley and Sons. Let the videos be your primary guide regarding the subject content on which to focus. However, the textbook is very valuable in the following ways providing additional examples, providing faster access to information. Tabbing while watching the videos is helpful. Tabbing the textbook while watching the videos is helpful in preparing you to be able to locate information quickly during tests. Tabbing is also good design for architectural practice where there's a vast amount of information that you need to be able to keep track of and access quickly. You will also have the textbook to take away as a reference after the course is done. All students entering the course should have already acquired a laptop computer running Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and AutoCAD, or an equivalent CAD software. And this does not mean Illustrator. It means a serious CAD program. In addition to the software above, a structural analysis software program called Multiframe will be used as part of lecture videos demonstrating certain structural phenomenon and for one or two assignments. Multiframe multi is available on the lab computers and can also be downloaded from an NCS website to your own computers. Students will be expected to spend approximately nine hours of time per week. Some of you are fairly strong in dealing with this kind of matter and subject matter and you may get by with fewer hours. Uh, some of you are not as strong and keeping up will require more than nine hours per week. Quizzes will be scheduled approximately twice weekly. Assignments will be scheduled approximately once, once weekly. Tests will be scheduled four times each semester, or in other words, about every four weeks. Each quiz counts for 1% of the course grade. Quizzes will be administered online. Each quiz will be available for at least a 24-hour window with no time limits within that window. A quiz will no longer be accessible when the window closes. <laughs>
quizzes are intended to prod you to keep up, which is why we close the window. If we let that slip, students start allowing things to get really behind, and that's dangerous. In ARC 331, each test counts for 12% of the overall grade. In ARC 332, each test counts for 13% of the overall grade. So tests are 48% of the overall grade in 331, and the four tests in 332 account for 52% of the overall grade. If you are satisfied with your grades on the four tests that you take over the course of the semester, you do not have to be present during the final exam period. During the final exam period, the following retakes will be offered. Test 1 retake will cover the first quarter of the semester and will cover the same subject matter covered on Test 1. Test 2 retake will cover the subject matter covered in the first and the second quarter of the semester, which is the same material that was covered on Test 2, and so forth. The final grade on a given subject matter will be the higher of the grade on the original test and the grade on the test retake. If you miss a test during the course of the semester, for whatever reason that you missed it, then your grade on that subject matter will be based on the corresponding test retake that is offered during the final exam period. You can think of the test retake as the makeup test. You do not have to bring an excuse for not taking a test. You just show up for the corresponding test retake during the final exam period. The test retake can only raise your grade, and there is absolutely no risk that in taking the test retake, you can lower your grade. Likewise, there is no risk in taking any of the tests during the course of the semester, since you can do poorly on them and still have the test retake as the basis for establishing your final grade. It is generally prudent to not pass up a chance to establish a baseline grade by taking the tests when they are initially offered, even if you feel ill or ill-prepared. You may surprise yourself and make a grade that you decide you're perfectly satisfied with when you're confronted with staying for the final exam period uh, and doing a lot of additional work and missing time with your family. Tests and retakes will be administered at the Delta testing centers. All students get double time on all tests. In other words, the overwhelming majority of the students who properly studied the subject matter and properly prepared for the test will be expected to finish the test or makeup test in one hour. Two hours will be allocated for everyone on every test. At the test, you're allowed to bring the textbook, scientific calculator, and two sheets of blank scrap paper for performing simple calculations. That scrap paper will be taken up by the proctors at the end of the test. You may, during the test, access any videos and resource files for the course provided on the ARC 331 Moodle site. On test, you will be given access to Excel, which is an acceptable alternative to a scientific calculator. You may not access friends, cell phones, the internet, or any other resources. No cell phones for any purpose during tests. There will be regular assignments involving design challenges, model building assignments, hand calculations, spreadsheet analysis, computer simulations, and a variety of other things. The grade value of each assignment will be indicated on the schedule for the course. Assignments can be done collaboratively, but it is your duty to bring to the table your own ideas, insights, and critical judgments. The collaborative efforts with your classmates is not intended to shortcut or diminish the learning experience, but rather to enhance it through the sharing and articulation of ideas. Simply copying someone else's work without your own active and effective participation in the educational process is not acceptable. When work is submitted that was obviously copied from someone else, it will not be given credit. There are synergisms between the assignments and the test. Tests and makeup tests will have many questions that draw directly on the understanding that you acquired from the assignments. 
Long assignment problems will not be repeated on tests for obvious reasons. However, the essential understanding gleaned from the assignments will be tested. While taking the tests, remember what you did on the assignments so that questions related to assignment topics can be answered quickly and directly rather than being worked out from scratch. It is on these test questions that you get a chance to demonstrate that you truly understood the lessons of the assignments and that you are not simply mindlessly copying the work of someone else with whom you collaborated. The standard credit for late, home, uh, late assignments will be 50% of whatever it would have been if it had been on time. Assignments submitted more than a week late will not be accepted, and assignments submitted after solutions are posted will not be accepted. Sometimes solutions will be posted just a few days after the homework was due. All this suggests that you need to stay on top of the homework and get it in on time. The grading ranges are 90.00 to 100 is the A range. 80.00 to 89.99 is the B range, and so forth. The passing grade of a D- starts at 60. The course schedule is available on the Moodle website. This document is the nerve center for the course. Check it often to make sure that you are doing what you are supposed to be doing. If I make any changes, however slight, on that schedule, you will get a notification in the course announcements. So this is what the schedule for ARC 331 looks like for the first half of the semester. And you'll notice at the top here, um, there are topics for uh, Tuesday and topics for Thursday. The subject matter is laid out based on a hypothetical Tuesday-Thursday class schedule. This is done to establish a calibrated pace and measure for the class, even though there are no actual lecture times on Tuesday and Thursday since videos are available throughout the semester. To reinforce the pace and measure of the class, students will have to complete quizzes, assignments, and tests at regular intervals. Quizzes and assignments for Tuesday subject matter will be due by noon on Wednesday the day after, and quizzes and assignments for Thursday subject matter will be due by noon on Friday, the day after the Thursday subject matter was on the schedule. For each test, a testing day has been designated on which day no new subject matter will be introduced. However, for the convenience of the students, the testing window for each test will be spread over four days that the testing center is open. In the schedule above, Thursday 9-8 is designated as a day for test 1. However, the students will be able to go to the testing center on Thursday, Friday of that week or Monday or Tuesday of the following week. The range of acceptable dates are shown in green on the schedule above. The testing is on a first-come, first-served basis, so waiting until the last minute is a formula for disaster. Check the hours of the testing center for testing days to make sure that you know when to be there. In this, in this schedule, videos are indicated in a blue font. The numbers at the beginning of each video designate the chapter section and subsection for the subject matter in the textbook. For example, the video named 01.7.2b, which is right here, spans and proportions of steel trusses is from chapter one, section seven, subsection two, and the letter B means that there are multiple videos from that subsection of which this is the second video in the sequence. There are four tests in the course of the semester. As I mentioned earlier, each test counts 12% of the course grade for ARC 331 and 13% of the course grade for ARC 332. Each quiz counts 1% and the value of each assignment is shown in the column to the right in the assignment list. So you'll notice here, here's quiz two. That's the quiz that's due noon on Wednesday. The quiz points are one and all the quizzes are one and will continue to be until something fairly significant changes. Assignment one 
has a value of one point. In this case, test one has a value of 12 points. There are some assignments here that are fairly large. They represent a major project that we're going to talk about. So here's one that's six points, another one that's three, another one that's three, and so forth. These are pretty major assignments on which a fair amount of work is going to be done. And collectively, in fact, uh, all three of these uh, count together. They're part of one big project, which is worth 12 points. So that big project is the equivalent of uh, a test in this course. This is the second half of the semester that shows the other two tests, the third test here, the fourth test here, and the exam period during which the retakes, retakes of the tests are done, are administered. It also shows a down week, which is the last week of classes during which the university doesn't allow us to administer any new uh, major assignments or tests. And because our students are under so much pressure in studio during that week, we're going to compress all of our other work into the earlier parts of the semester so that the students can have that last week to uh, focus on their studio projects. Okay, so in this course we have uh, a slightly unusual pedagogical approach. Uh, most courses of this type begin the first day talking about equilibrium and action-reaction pairs and they start running numbers um, to begin to teach the most basic kinds of structural concepts. Architecture students have a hard time understanding how that's related to what they do for a living. And so in this cor course, our pedagogical approach is going to be to begin by leaping into the deep end of the pool in something we call the initial foray into structural design. So the key topics that we're going to deal with are primarily conceptual. We're going to look at a bunch of experimental demonstrations of key structural concepts and behaviors. Then we're going to focus on conceptualizing a structure as a system of parts selected and assembled in a manner to resist all vertical forces, such as gravity downward and wind suction upward, and all horizontal forces in all directions, which could be north-south wind or east-west wind, or forces in all those directions that are seismic in origin. The students are going to conceptualize the structure also to address an intended architectural purpose. So in this initial foray into structural design, the students are going to decide what the building function is, what spaces it's going to contain, how big those spaces are, and so forth. Subject to the limitation that the spans involved have to be significant enough to be structurally challenging. The students are then going to apply guidelines for spans and proportions of common spanning members, such as beams, parallel cord trusses, triangular trusses, bow trusses, rigid frames, vaults, domes, suspension structures, and cable networks. So we're going to start that process by talking about types of structural action, because we need to know what different parts of the building are doing and how we can choose the right kind of member to do that. So here are the three most common forms of structural action. Here we have this eighth inch diameter plastic rod which has been glued into these blocks at each end and a weight hung off of it. So this is what we call axial tension where there is a tension force along the length or the axis of the member. Notice that there's a pretty sizable force here. It could have been a much heavier weight but I just didn't want to smash the floor in the event that it did fail. Um, over here we see that same member in axial compression. Originally this member was straight and we loaded weights on it until it buckled and we stopped it in mid-buckle or mid-failure by putting this, we put in there beforehand a 2x4 block. So we're freezing the failure part way down. This is an abrupt process. It is not self-limiting but it happens so fast that in order to capture this on a photograph, we had to put this wooden block in there to stop it part way down. 
You'll notice the weight involved in buckling this element is way less than the weight that's currently being held without any real effort by this member in tension. This is one of the reasons why I often say tension is a more uh, efficient form of structural action than compression because tension is not limited by buckling. Axial compression is limited by this tendency of the material to shoot off to the side and get out from under the load. The third most common, common kind of loading is bending. Here we had forces along the length of the member, so we called them axial forces. Bending involves forces that are perpendicular, perpendicular to the axis of the member. Bending is generally less efficient than axial compression. So tension is more efficient than compression, which is more efficient than bending. And we're going to talk more throughout this course about the significance of structural efficiency in various circumstances and identify those circumstances where it's most critical both technically and economically. The fourth and somewhat less common form of structural action is torsion. Here we have three th elements. This is a square tube. This is a flat slab which was made by taking four of these pieces and gluing them together. And then this is an I section which has the same amount of material as this section and that section. It just has a different cross-sectional shape. We tend to think of an I section as being extremely efficient because they work so well in bending. But this, this demonstration uh, illustrates the fact that they are very poor in torsion. So you'll notice we have weights out here that are creating torque in each of these elements. Each of these elements is allowed to rotate around a pin that supports the end of it. And how much rotation occurs depends on the resistance of the element. So you'll notice the square tube has the highest force and the highest torque. The slab has the next highest force and torque. And the least force and least torque is on the I section. And yet, in spite of that fact, the greatest torsion or torsional deformation is observed in this I section. The next lower is here, and there's so little torsional deformation in this square tube that it's not discernible in this photograph. So what that says is if we want a good torsional member, it should be a closed tube. All right, so we're going to talk about quickly some examples of tension. Here's a building that's sta stabilized by cross-bracing elements here and here. So under a wind load or seismic event pushing in this direction, this member stabilizes the building by going into tension. It takes that tension load down to the foundation. In the process, it induces more compression into this element. So we have a compression member here and a tension member there that's stabilizing the building under forces in this direction. Uh, when we talk about these elements, by the way, over the course of this part of the semester, uh, we're going to talk a lot about connections. So down at the base of this build, of this structure, right down here, we have a detail that looks like this. Uh, that rod is coming through, and you'll notice it's threaded on the end. There's a nut here that allows us to adjust both the length of that member and the amount of tension in it. We adjust the length to get the building straight and vertical, and then we add additional uh, torquing on the nut to create enough tension that those rods do not go slack and um, create a phenomenon we call rod bang, where as the wind shifts back and forth, uh, those members snap into tension. Okay, so here are some cross-bracing elements on the horizontal stabilizing this uh, huge overhang. This is part of the... Uh, California Academy of Sciences. It's a really beautiful building that you should visit if you're ever in San Francisco. This is an interior structure. Um, these elements are arch shaped. They run up to the zenith of the dome. They work in compression. They're not a very good shape for an arch though, so they tend to bulge outward uh, at this lower portion, both in that direction. They bulge outward in every direction in the lower portion of this dome. These horizontal hoops are called tension hoops, and they hold these compression members 
from bulging outward. They force them to stay in the shape they're in. So under gravity loads, these members go into tension. These members are in compression. Under wind or seismic effects, to the left here, this member goes into tension, which throws compression into that member, which puts tension into that member, and it all gets traced back down to the foundation. This is the Cathedral of Christ the Light in Oakland, California, designed by Craig Hartman of SOM. All these vertical, uh, excuse me, these straight external elements on the exterior and the curved elements on the interior are laced together with a whole series of uh, compression members and tension members that allow those inner and outer structural surfaces to work together to stabilize this building. We can use tension members for really challenging structures, long span heavy loads. Um, this is a roof structure that was designed by Aero Saarinen at the Dulles Airport. Uh, notice these incredibly delicate steel cables. Those steel cables are able to resist 250,000 pounds of stress per pounds per square inch of stress. You'll notice a very long span. You'll also notice concrete planks that are finishing off the roof structure. This enormous weight of these concrete planks is being supported by these very delicate steel cam cables. Now, those concrete planks turn out to be pretty important. Um, super lightweight steel cables may be very strong and effective in resisting gravity. But if they are shaped to resist gravity, they are worthless in resisting the upward force of wind suction. So under wind suction, you can get this kind of violent movement that's uh, uh, illustrated in the drawing at the bottom. So in the case of Dulles Airport, they not only put all these heavy concrete planks to hold it down, but they poured another layer of concrete and they formed it up so that concrete could go down between these planks and form ribs. So they got a huge amount of dead weight to hold the structure down under the uplift force of suction, but also to avoid non-uniform forces such as shifting snow load, drifting snow load, or uh, uneven wind suction. They got some beam-like action due to this concrete that went down between the concrete planks. We can often uh, use classical engineering marvels like the Golden Gate Bridge, which can be mined for ideas for buildings. In this case, the draped suspension elements, which is this, and the vertical suspenders support the dead weight of the roadbed and of uniform vehicle load. While the trusses along the side of the bridge resist shifting loads of vehicular traffic which can sometimes be highly concentrated in localized parts of the bridge. Without these trusses, the localized loads would cause radical changes in the shape of the suspension structure. So we can apply a concept like that. This is the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, designed by Gunnar Burkert and engineered by Leslie Robertson. The dead weight of the 10 floors and the uniform occupancy load on those floors are supported by the suspension structure, which is this element right here. The spanning system, the spanning system was adopted to avoid cluttering the underground vaults with a regular array of columns coming down from above. So this structure spans a, a city block, roughly 300 feet, and then it has trusses spanning in the other direction for about 70 feet. So each floor is about 70 feet by 300 feet of uh, uninterrupted space. There are no columns or support structures of any kind in there. Where the uh, suspension elements are supported at this point and that point, they induce compression in these towers. The towers have to support the suspension structure there. The suspension structures also induce compression in this truss. If the truss wasn't there, this suspension element would tend to pull the tower over. 
The truss element across the top also works to resist deformation under shifting live loads. These trusses are much deeper in proportions than the ones along the side of the roadbed on the Golden Gate Bridge because deformation in the support structure of the building carries the risk that the glass in the facade will shatter or fall out. Glass is brittle and extremely intolerant of much movement in the facade, which is why these trusses are very deep. This is an image of the building during construction. A couple of things to note here. All of these vertical elements that come to bear on the top of the suspension element are rendered as heavier elements. All the ones below are actually suspension elements that are hanging off of the suspension off of this uh, suspension element. So these are called suspenders. This is the suspension element. And then these are columns that are coming down to bear on that. So when we look at the suspension element, we see the columns up above are rendered as eye sections or wide flanges to help them resist buckling. Whereas the elements down below are made out of one inch by eight inch slab that set edge on. So this shows what it looks like. It's set edge on to allow maximum transparency to the building. This is what the building looks like in its finished state. This is a view of a close-up of the facade and you'll notice in the portions above the suspension element where there's compression in these columns they have the glass has been moved back and the columns have been clad in this black material to emphasize the additional weight and ruggedness of those elements. Down below where there's suspension elements, the glass has been moved out to the facade to accentuate the diaphanous and delicate quality of that. When this building is photographed from the side, the depth of those mullions and the inset of the glass produces this rather dramatic image. Now here's a structure where the uh, tension element is curved in the suspension form and the compression element that makes that work across the top uh, is straight. We can also do a structure where the compression element is curved and the tension element across the bottom is straight. This is the Broadgate Exchange building in London um, designed by SOM. The building straddles several train lines, each of which is on a curving path under the building, which is what motivated the designers to simply span across all of that rather than try to figure out a way to put down a regular uh, array or a regular grid of columns. This structure also spans about one city block, supports 10 stories. That's all the concrete floor slabs in the 80 pounds a square foot of live load that we have to design for in offices. So this is an example of both a long span structure and a very heavily loaded structure. Again, this is a structure where the compression member is changing shape and the tension member is straight. Before we saw one where the compression member was straight and the tension member was curved. We can also do structures um, where there is some shape effect on both the compression part and the tension part. These are the uh, Gulam arches in the Raleigh-Durham uh, International Airport, which was designed by Fentress Architects. And this shows um, the tension member at the end. This is called a clevis. It comes on each side of this uh, steel plate, and the pin is what connects them together. Um, this is a threaded rod, which goes into this part of the housing and into that. It has a left-handed thread on one end and a right-handed thread on the other. So with an appropriately designed wrench, when this rod is rotated, this element and that element can either be drawn closer together or allowed to spread further apart. And that's how the tension and the final geometry of the structure is established. Here's another example of a structure where there's uh, a change in shape of the tension member at the bottom. Uh, this shows a connector again with clevises at the middle of that structure. And if we put in enough of these vertical struts, compression struts, we can actually create a structure where we have a nice smooth curve on the top and a smooth curve on the bottom. We call this a lenticular structure.
This has that same shape, but it's a different structural concept. In this case, we have compression on the top and tension on the bottom. Here we have a cable on that side and a cable on that side. This is sometimes called a lenticular cable truss. Uh, this was one that was designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill, and it was put in one of their structures in Virginia. Um, in this case, these two cables are counter-tensioned against each other, and that's the source of stability. So when there is wind blowing against the glass face here, this member goes in greater tension. That induces greater compression, but allows less tension force or creates less tension force in this outside cable. When there's wind suction pulling the glass out, this tension element is activated and works with this compression element to resist all those forces. So this is an example of uh, a dual cable system where one set of cables is designed to resist a force in one direction, the other set of cables is designed to resist a force in the other direction, and those cables are counter-tensioned against each other to make sure that none of them go slack and start exhibiting too much movement. This is the connector again, and again we have clevises here and uh, a means of uh, adjusting the tension in these elements. Now in these elements you'll notice they're all within a plane, um, so it's easy to conceptualize. We have a tension member there, a tension member here, compression struts in between, and then a primary compression member down the center. Um, but we can do things that are more sophisticated even than that, where the two cables are able to uh, post-tension or counter-tension each other at the same time. Um, they, these counter-tensioning cables do not need to be in the same plane. This is the Seattle-Tacoma Airport designed by Fentress Architects. These curved elements right here resist wind force against the wall or overpressure on the outside of the glass. These curved ones in the horizontal planes um, resist wind suction outward from the walls. And again, these cables all have to be counter-tensioned so that we don't get too much movement in this facade. In Raleigh, North Carolina, we have Dorton Arena, which was designed by Matthew Nowitzki. This was the first really long span cable network structure ever created. It's very famous. It's a really beautiful structure, which is now almost 65 years old, but it's still very fresh. Uh, and every time I walk in it, it feels like a, a really new experience. People come from all around the world to Raleigh, North Carolina, just to see Dorton Arena. So here's one parabolic arch and another parabolic arch and the vertical columns, which uh, initially in construction were holding up these arches, but some of which actually go into tension eventually. So between the arches are suspended cables in a parabolic form. Every one of these cables is the same mathematical parabola and they are all there to resist gravity loads, such as snow or the weight of whatever decking goes on top of this. Um, these cables are then kept from flying away by passing uh, wind cables over the top of them. Um, so here are the gravity cables draped down in the wind cables over the top of them. This is what that structure looks like from the aerial view. This is a view from the roof for the person over there to give some sense of scale. This is a view from the ground and a view from the interior. It is one of the most beautiful, exhilarating, wonderfully daylit spaces that I've ever been in. Again, there have to be ways to tension these cables. Here's some heavy cables that uh, are connected to this sort of horseshoe system with two nuts there that are used to make adjustments. This lighter cable is tensioned with a simple turnbuckle. Okay, so that's a bunch of examples of um, tension and compression to get the students thinking about, um, creatively thinking about what sort of structure they might want to generate. Now we're going to talk about something that's generally um, a bit more mundane. It's a lot more commonly used at smaller scales and smaller spans which is called bending.
Here we have a foam rubber beam at the top, which is at rest. Um, it's just laying on the desk, and this beam, by the way, tends to be straight under its own accord. When we lift up both ends of it and put them on the bricks, this is now spanning from brick to brick, and it's deforming under its own self-weight. So here we drew two vertical black lines, which, since they were both vertical, they were parallel to each other. After we lift this up and it's loaded, they're no longer vertical. They're closer together at the top. They're further apart at the bottom, which says this material is elongating and must be under tension. This material is shortening and must be under compression. And that corresponds to this stress pattern. So here we have the maximum compression at the top. It goes to zero at the so-called neutral axis and maximum tension at the bottom of the material. And you'll notice there's a bunch of compression force up here and tension force on there. And the only way the top part can be restrained from moving in that direction and the bottom part from moving in this direction is if they're knit together through the strength of the material on this plane. So we say there is a major shear that's occurring along that plane that's the result of a force in that direction and another force in this direction. There are three common failure modes for bending members. Um, one is that the tension on the bottom can crack it in the middle or the compression might crush material on the top. Um, either one of those modes can occur and which one tends to occur depends on the nature of the material. If it's wood where the wood knots tend to weaken the wood a little bit in tension, it'll tend to occur on the bottom. This is another failure mode that's common in wood where that shear force or shear stress that we were just talking about tends to cause the material to delaminate. And I want you to keep this image in mind because we're going to talk about it again in a few minutes. So we can have shear failure, we can have failure due to this internal moment or the compression and tension stresses on the cross section. And finally, we can have a failure just due to a lack of stiffness. So let's talk about each of those. This is an example of a stiffness failure. This beam is so uh, lacking in stiffness that it's collapsing through under its own self-weight. Um, these are really important concepts that we're going to get out of these unbelievably mundane and simple experiments. This is a very, very weak beam. If we take that same element and we turn it up vertically, all of a sudden it can support its own weight and then a little more on top of that. And it's very stiff if you sight along it, its vertical movement is negligible. But you're beginning to observe some lateral movement, which is tending to occur because of the compression in the top of this beam. The beam wants, the, the, the top of the beam is acting kind of like a column, and it wants to buckle to the side. So lateral instability is a major concern in beams like this and if we add a little more of this weight the beam does collapse off to the side it's not a very good beam um, even though it's got fairly deep proportions now we can take that same three uh, inch wide strip of styrene plastic and we can cut it into three strips and glue those strips together and we end up with this eye section or wide flange section if we want to call it that in this case one strip of this material has been laid horizontal to create the top flange. Another horizontal strip is creating the bottom flange. And then the material knitting them together is called the web. Okay, so one of the things we can do is we can look for inspiration about how to configure our building or some part of our building in these diagrams. So one thing we notice here is the moment is a maximum at the center. So we might want to change the cross-section so that we make the, the cross-section deeper where the moment has to be. We've already ascertained that making the beam deeper is beneficial and it would seem logical to make it deeper where the issues are the most severe. So this is an example under wind load against the wall of this building. These glass mullions are serving as bending members and they've been made the deepest at the center where the moment is the greatest. This is another example of a beam where the depth of the beam has been made the deepest at the center of where the moment is the most severe. Here's an example also where the depth has been made the greatest where the moment is the greatest except now this is no longer a simple span but it is a cantilevered beam.
but nonetheless in this the moment is the most severe at the end here and this beam has been tapered to be deepest at that location. Here's another example where the variation in the depth of the beam is made in response to variations in the internal moment. We talked about before that this is a tension cable roof. That tension cable is pulling this element over to the left. It's trying to make it turn over. Uh, Saarinen sloped this element to sort of express the action of that member sort of leaning backward like a human being would do to try and pull on a rope. Um, but that column, and the, the whole series of columns, is nowhere near heavy enough to resist the horizontal pull of this roof with this enormous uh, concrete load on it. So this is actually acting like a cantilever beam sticking up out of the earth. It's been made widest at the base to express that that's where the most severe moment is occurring. And also we can see something about the action of it from this image right over here. You sort of sense that if this element is pulling in that direction, we must be creating more compression on this side and tension on that side. And you see over here, this is some of the steel that was being used to reinforce those elements. Everywhere it looks black and dense. That's because there's so much steel rebar there that you can't see through it. No light is getting through it. Now there's still space between all those rebar elements because we have to have that in order to get the concrete between the rebar. But it's a commentary on how much tensile steel there is there um, that we can't see through it. And all of that is to keep these columns from being pulled over by that roof. So here's another example where the variations in the depth of the bending member are in response to variations in the internal moment. Here we have a cantilever coming off of this vertical. That cantilever is creating the most intense moment there where we have compression on the bottom, tension on the top. At some point we transition into the zone of simple span which is being supported at the end of this cantilever. And the cantilever is pretty thick because it not only supports the load on it, but it's also supporting a huge load at its end due to its portion of the simple span. You'll notice the simple span is being made deeper at the center, where the moment of the simple span is the worst and thinnest near the end. And then again on this end we have another cantilever, which is creating a very intense moment at that joint, which is why the structure is thickest at that point. So based on our simple experiments, we concluded that reconfiguring the material from a flat slab to an eye section helps it be stiffer and stronger in bending. So in other words, this was an exercise in shaping the cross section for bending and we concluded that reconfiguring it in this member way makes it stiffer and stronger. This is how that's manifest in actual construction. This is a steel eye, flange, eye section, sometimes called a wide flange because it's been rolled with very wide flanges on the top and on the bottom. So this is wide flange or eye section at a fairly modest scale. This particular beam is like 12 inches deep. We can also invoke that same concept at a much larger scale. So this is the, uh, again, the um, Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. If you imagine wind against this big face, it's trying to blow the building over in that direction. These towers are acting as cantilevers coming out of the foundations, and that bending action is expressed by these huge eye sections, which are made out of concrete. But it's a, it's a beautiful and fascinating way to take a, a concept that works both at the very small scale and at the very large scale. Uh, we can make eye sections out of wood. The key thing is that the material in the webbing has to be much more resistive to splitting than just normal sawn lumber. In this case it's oriented strand board, but plywood really works well in that case also. Uh, here's an example. We're actually changing the shape of the cross section along the member. This is made out of welded up plate. These are plate girders. Um, so plate was cut for the webs and plate is cut for the flanges. 
and in this case they couldn't get long enough pieces of material for the flanges anyway. They knew they were going to have to have joints in the flanges, so they used extra thick and extra wide flange material out towards center span where the moment is the worst and narrower, not so thick flange material uh, near the ends. These welds, by the way, have to be extremely high quality because they are, in essence, going to be responsible for carrying the load as if the structural member was continuous across it. Here's sort of the ultimate example of shaping the cross section. So here we're starting with this sort of squarish or blocky end, which gives us a nice end bearing surface. And out towards the middle, the top flange guts much wider, which is what we want it to do to resist the additional compression force near the center, but also to avoid lateral buckling of the members. Now, there's something else we can do. We don't necessarily have to create every bending element originally as a single unit. Sometimes we have elements that we can connect together, uh, sometimes at the site, to make them work in something we call composite action. So I'm showing you this image again of a piece of wood failing due to shear. This piece of wood worked together great. Um, it was very deep and very stiff and very strong until the shearing action occurred and then it's like two shallower members that don't work nearly as well. So this wood has inherently got composite action until the moment that this shear stress failure occurs. So here's another physical demonstration. Up at the top we have a piece of eighth inch thick uh, acrylic. It looks black because it's smoky acrylic, um, <clears throat> which happened to be cheap and we used it for this experiment. So we're using this as a very shallow beam so we can observe deflection effects. And it has this very small weight in the middle. Down at the bottom we've taken 10 of these pieces of acrylic and we've laid them loosely on top of each other. Uh, they're not glued together and there's very little friction between them. So they're basically able to exhibit that sort of shear deformation relative to each other. Here we've put 10 times as much weight on as up above. We have 10 times as many elements and we're observing almost exactly the same deflection. So we would say these 10 beams are working together to support this load. They're 10 times stronger than one of them, but they're nowhere near as strong as they would be if we could glue them together and make them work in what we call composite action. And so this is a demonstration of that. Here we have the 10 that aren't glued together. Here we have 10 others that are glued together. You'll notice we have a much higher weight here, but also we have no discernible deflection. So the one on the bottom is not only much stronger, but it's much, much stiffer by our having achieved this composite action. So we can do this with wood. This is something we call glue lamb, where we take two by fours or two by sixes or two by eights and we glue them together. And so this beam is more like um, 30 or 36 inches deep. Uh, and it's basically a bunch of two bys glued together to create this structure. We can also get composite action uh, between dissimilar materials. So here we have a wide flange steel beam. On the top of it we have something called uh, welded shear studs. Those studs are going to be embedded in the concrete that will ultimately get poured on top of this. And then when a live load comes along and starts to bend the beam down, the beam is going to force that concrete to work with the beam. So if this beam is 12 inches deep and then we have 6 inches of concrete by achieving the composite action, we've gone from a beam that's effectively 12 inches deep to a beam that's effectively 18 inches deep. And in many instances, there was no reason to have that concrete there other than to assist in this particular um, composite action. Uh, here's what those shear studs look like after the corrugated steel decking is down and some wiring. So the concrete is going to get poured on top of this and it's going to surround these shear studs. And once it solidifies, the shear studs will force it to work in composite action with the steel beam below. So we talked about uh, torsion as a fourth form of, of uh, structural action and we said
the stiffest and strongest elements are going to be closed tubular forms. And so here we have an example. Here is a curved bridge above. Um, it's in bending between one support point and the next support point. Um, it's also in torsion because it's curved between these two points. And so when it gets loaded uniformly, that curve tends to induce torque in the member at the ends. But aside from that, you'll notice that the deck that supports the pedestrian load up here is cantilevered off. It's cantilevered off to both sides. But if you have everybody standing on one side of this bridge to have their picture taken uh, or to just to look at something, they're going to create a huge torque on that member. The response in this case has been to use a round steel tube, which is a really excellent uh, member for both bending and torsion. Again, we have something similar. Here we have a curved roadbed that has bending between that point and that point. It also has torsion due to the curvature of the roadbed. And then, of course, the potential to have all kinds of traffic just on one side of the bridge, which will amplify that torquing effect. So again, we have a tubular cross section, and this thing has to get anchored to the supports in a way where the supports won't let this tube rotate over. Okay, so now we're going to talk about conceptualizing the structural system. And one of the concepts we're going to really lean on heavily is the notion of mutually braced sheets of materials. And I sometimes use the word pla planes of materials, but uh, I really like the word sheets because they don't have to be exactly planes in order for this concept to work. So experimentally, we did this experiment. We discovered this element wants to work pretty well vertically, but it's laterally unstable. So one of the things we can do with a beam like this is we can nail decking down to the top of it. And if this is a proper diaphragm where these sheets of plywood are connected together along these edges, it becomes like a deep beam that stabilizes the tops of these uh, two by 10 joists so that the tops don't tend to buckle laterally. We can also um, create an eye section, which is like the ultimate uh, paradigm for this notion of mutually braced sheets of material. There is a top flange with a horizontal sheet, a bottom flange which is a horizontal sheet, and then there's a vertical web which is a, a vertical sheet of material, and everywhere they meet they are mutually bracing sheets of material. So this eye section is way more stable structurally from every point of view than this flimsy, thin piece of sheet from which it was originally fabricated. Now, in the case of steel, we don't glue these things together. They're rolled and uh, mashed into the shape. But here we have our flange at the top, the flange at the bottom, the vertical web, and where they connect together, they are mutually bracing. Another example of mutually bracing sheets of material is this is corrugated decking, which is rolled out of a continuous sheet, but it has, it's given the shape. So here we have a vertical surface, here we have a vertical surface, here we have a horizontal surface, there we have a horizontal surface. Everywhere those surfaces meet each other, they are mutually bracing sheets of material. Here's another example. The, uh, Trusses represent a plane or a sheet of material which has a lot of holes in it, but in the vertical direction it's very strong. Uh, it's laterally very weak. One of the most common costs is lateral damage to trusses when they're just being transported to the site or lifted into place. They're laterally very weak, but once they're connected into the roof decking, the roof decking stabilizes those trusses. So the roof diaphragm and these vertical planar trusses are mutually bracing sheets of material. Here's another example. The trusses on each side are the height of the walking space in between. They resist vertical forces really well. There is a diaphragm roof up above which resists horizontal forces as well as a diaphragm floor down below. So this produces a really stable structure because there are four structural elements that are mutually bracing. Here's another example. We have triangulated trusses on the side to resist vertical forces. 
lateral forces are resisted in the rigid frame action of this element and that element being welded to these cross pieces with really stiff moment connections. Mutually braced triangulated trusses and rigid frames. Wood construction has been uh, plagued since the beginning of time by problems with how we connect it together. Here's a standard way of nailing two boards together. Um, those connections are so weak that this person literally can push these members over with a single finger. They are very weak joints. Not what you want to rely on to hold your building up. On the other hand, when we nail a sheet of sheathing to the side of that, that person can put his full weight and force into it. You, you detect essentially no deformation in the sheathing, but you know, notice the curvature of this beam at the bottom. That curvature is being induced because as he pushes horizontally, this member starts to pull up on that joint, and this member starts to push down on that joint. So that's an example of mutually braced elements, structural elements. The principle of mutually braced sheets of material can be applied at the scale of the building, and we commonly do this in over 99% of the buildings we design. This is the first step in the conceptualization of the building. So here we have a really weak wall that's attached to a narrow footing and this wall can easily be blown over in a wind. It was not designed ever to withstand a wind. And to emphasize this point, by the way, the number one cause of death on construction sites is unbraced walls collapsing on workers. Sometimes when those walls get tall enough, they just collapse under their own uh, instability, their own self-weight, but just the slightest wind will blow them off over because they were not designed to resist this kind of force. In the case of this chipboard model, as you can imagine, all this person has to do is just barely tap on that wall and it falls over. If we connect the four walls together at the corner, then they become mutually bracing at the ends and stronger at the ends. They still are weak and deformed more than we would like near the top center of the wall. So now we can glue a roof diaphragm down or connect a roof diaphragm and now the upper edges of the walls are stabilized. So there's this mutual symbiotic relationship between the vertically strong walls and the horizontally strong diaphragm roof. And we don't get into these kinds of free body diagrams too much in the first few weeks of the class, but we will be doing this over the course of the year. So here we have a boxy shaped building with four vertical walls and a diaphragm roof. Here we have a wind over pressure and a wind suction on the other side. So this diaphragm roof supports the top edge of that wall from falling over. By action-reaction pairs, that wall pushes on the roof diaphragm, and the roof diaphragm needs to be stabilized. So it carries its force or load over to the side walls, and the side walls support it by creating this edge force. So think of this diaphragm roof as like a, a beam that is this deep, and it's spanning that far. Roof diaphragms are generally very efficient because they have really excellent proportions. So now that force gets transferred to the top of the shear wall and ultimately the shear wall is stabilized by the foundation producing a force in the other direction. So we want students to start thinking about this, act, this idea of how are all the parts and pieces of the building interacting with each other and how are they helping each other out. Here we have some weak columns and uh, even weaker floor slab. We can stabilize that with shear walls. We can stabilize it with triangulation, in this case with cross bracing, which uh, may allow a fair amount of light and, and ventilation through, but you can't walk through them. Um, we can do rigid frame. Um, rigid frame and shear wall, by the way, are different only in degree. Uh, when these elements start getting narrow enough, we can't take a sort of normal uh, shear wall construction and assume that's going to work. 
we have to start thinking carefully about how these joints are made and we have to analyze it uh, differently. But I show this example because architecturally it's a very, a very valuable example. You can do a building where you have absolutely no obstructions in walking through it except for these rigid frame elements. And we have one of these as an example. This is the World Trade Center in New York. Um, all these joints were welded up as if the columns and the beams went continuously through each other. And within this building there are no shear walls and no triangulation or cross bracing of any kind. Only rigid frames which form these mutually bracing sheets or planes of materials. Sometimes these mutually bracing sheets are not planes, they're curved surfaces. So here we have a barrel vault which tends to assume this shape when there's no lateral load. When we tug on it, it tends to deform very easily in this manner. If we take two barrel vaults and we intersect them at right angles to each other and then we remove all the interior material, we produce the classic cross vault or groin vault, which is not only much stronger than the barrel vault by virtue of the mutually bracing sheets of material, but it's much lighter and produces a much more gratifying kind of architectural experience. As part of this initial foray, we, spent a f we will spend a fair amount of time working, looking at guidelines for spans and proportions of common elements. So what that means is, from our experiments we be with beams, we learned that depth of the spanning element is important. This vertical element is working a lot better than the shallow flat one. All different types of spanning elements or spanning systems have inherent limits on how shallow they can be while still making sense structurally and economically. So I want to run through some examples of common spanning members. This is corrugated uh, decking on the roof of a building. Um, Corrugated decking can typically span with, with fairly heavy gauge sheet metal, can span up to 64 times its depth. So this is inch and a half corrugated decking, and so here you'll notice up here it says for inch and a half corrugated steel roofing deck, we can span up to 64 times the depth, or in other words, the depth can be L over 64 which is about an eight foot span. So in understanding these tables, look across the top. This says the typical mac maximum span L in feet for this kind of structural member. So here we have 20 feet, 10 feet, and this is about eight. If we had three inch corrugated roofing decking, it could span about 16 feet. In this particular photograph, it's spanning about six feet, which is considered more optimal, optimal Pushing it to eight feet is not necessarily considered to be the most economical thing to do, but one has to look at the circumstances to see. So I'm going to go through a whole series of these real quick just to show you examples. And by the way, the book and the videos contain many more examples, but I'm going to just hit the highlights. You'll notice the top of this scale is 200 feet. We're way down here, eight feet, with this kind of decking. When we go to wide flange beams, which have a cross section like this, the shallowest is typically the span over 28. The deepest is usually limited to about span over 18. These are approximate numbers, but they're based on economic optimization. And by the way, I want to mention at this point, a cantilever made out of a certain kind of cross-section typically only goes half as far as a simple span. So we can just take these and cut them in half, and now the, the uh, proportions of the steel wide flange as a cantilever, the maximum depth would be roughly L over 9, and the shallowest would be L over 14. So these diagrams are, are drawn at a proportion of L over 18, that one's drawn at L over 28. Here's a how truss. It can span up to about 100 feet. Uh, in the case of the uh, 
wide flange beams, the limit is about 80 feet because we just don't roll them deep enough. The machinery is too expensive to roll such deep beams. So we're typically limited to about 80 feet. A how truss can go further. You'll notice the shallowest is the span divided by five. So this height right here is this dimension divided by five. Here's the deepest with a span with a depth of the span over four. There's not a wide range here because you don't want to make it too shallow. Otherwise, the forces in the cord members are too high. And if you make it too deep, the web members tend to buckle. Um, the Fink truss tends to have shorter web members. And so it can be made much longer span without the web members becoming so long they tend to buckle. Again, the proportions here for the shallowest Fink truss is the span over five, which looks like this and the deepest is the span over four, which looks like that. Parallel core trusses also can typically span up to about 200 feet. They can go a lot further than that if we want to, but normally we find some other way to do things that's a little more efficient, but even then, parallel core trusses work fine um, up to a 200 foot span and they can go beyond that. Uh, the shallowest we ever do is a parallel core truss of depth the span over 24. So in other words, this depth right here is 1 24th of that length. The deepest we typically will go is a span of L over 12, which looks like that. So here we see a classic um, web configuration for a parallel cord truss. Um, parallel cord trusses are incredibly economical. They're incredibly reliable and they're cranked out in billions of linear feet every year in the United States. And I just throw this in as an example of what uh, a variety of functions parallel cords can be put to. Rigid frames made of welded up steel plate having the configuration shown here can span up to about 200 feet. The shallowest rise. So we have two things we have to think about here in spans and proportions. One is the rise, which is how high this point is above the base point. So here we have a high rise here we have a shallower rise, and then it's also very important the proportions of this cantilever. So the shallowest will be um, a rise of the span over six, and the, the highest rise or the deepest will be a, a rise of the span over two, which looks like this. Um, the depth of this cantilever is typically in the range of the length of the cantilever over 14 or the length of the cantilever over 10. So LC over 10 is the deep end, LC over 14 is the shallow end. This is what a structure like that looks like in practice. Um, this is one of the few somewhat more attractive uh, versions of this that I could find. Um, these structures are so incredibly efficient and economical that we tend to use them for um, really low-end applications like warehouses and auto repair shops, uh, but they can be incredibly beautiful. This is an atrium in Chicago in a building right next to the Sears Tower. This is what that looks like close up. So this whole notion of rigid frames, they're very efficient. They can be very beautiful, but it requires somebody with a good design sense uh, um, making an effort to make them that way. Um, this is another configuration. Again, this is like a cantilever here and a cantilever there and a simple span in between. These can span up to about 300 feet. Now notice we've taken a quantum jump here. The previous scale went from 0 to 200. Everything we talked about up till now went to 200. Now we're going from 0 to 1000. And it would have been wonderful if we could have gotten all these on the same scale, but the scale is so extraordinary that um, it just can't can't be done graphically. So keep in mind now we're on the scale here of a thousand. We're spanning up to about 300 feet with this structure. Uh, the shallowest rise is about L over six. Here the deepest rise is L over five. So there's not much of a range. And if we go to a much higher range here, this geometry doesn't make sense anymore and we need to rethink what we're doing.
And again, we're given depths of the cantilevers and depth of the simple span. So the simple span goes from there to there and represents about 60% of the overall span. The length of the cantilever represents about 20% of the overall span. And not surprisingly for the simple span, the shallowest is L over 28. We saw that for wide flanges. We're seeing it again here. The deepest here is typically the simple span over 28 for the depth of the simple span. The depth of the cantilever is in the range of L over 10 to L over 8. And the reason it's so deep, before we had, we had shallower cantilevers, remember this cantilever is not just supporting the decking it's supporting, but it's also supporting the end of this simple span, which is meeting it at that point. This is uh, a configuration that spans up to about 300 feet also. Uh, it's trussed, it has a single tapered cantilever, and again, it, we have rise uh, limitations. The deepest is typically a rise that's the span over two. The shallowest is a rise that's the span of L over three. Any of these can be violated, uh, but there will be costs associated with it, and typically we don't because if we go messing with this geometry too much, it will probably turn out that some other geometry makes more sense. Arches can span up to, in buildings, up to about 400 feet. Of course, we have arches that are for bridge structures and whatnot that go way beyond that, but typically uh, 400 feet is kind of a limit. Um, this image right here of the Broadgate Exchange House, it's spanning roughly a city block, which is around 300 feet or so, a bit less than that in this case. Um, and the proportions can go anywhere from about L over 4 to L over 2, where L is the span from that point to that point. This is a bow truss. We have structures in sports arenas that span up to 700 feet. Um, so this is way beyond any of the ones we've seen before. The shallowest is typically a, a depth of a span over 10. The deepest is a depth of the span over six, which looks like that. So each of these images represents whatever those proportions are. And here you see curved uh, corrugated decking. Great application for corrugated decking because it's stiff and spans well from truss, from bow truss to bow truss. But in the other direction, it, it's very rubbery and curves itself very easily to the shape of the bow truss. Um, and again, I want to emphasize this is not all the types of structures that we will talk about, but um, I'm uh, hitting the highlights of some of them. These are uh, steel network domes. Um, the depth will typically be the, at the shallow end, the span over 8. At the deep end, it might be L over 4. It can even be L. Well, let's put it this way. It's gone way beyond L over 4 in that we have domes that are more than even a hemisphere. And a hemisphere would be the span over two. Um, but for efficient logical structure, uh, these are sort of the common ranges that we use. This is a network dome um, at the North Carolina Zoo um, in Asheboro. And structures of this type, by the way, have spanned up to 700 feet. The Louisiana Superdome is an example of a very long span uh, steel network dome. Finally, as part of the initial foray into structural design, the students will incorporate daylighting. We do that for several reasons. Natural light is almost always an important part of good architectural design. Incorporating the apertures that are required for daylighting creates interesting structural challenges. And finally, we're trying to introduce energy efficiency and sustainability into all of our classes and understanding the energy implications of daylighting is fairly important. So in the case of daylighting, we have nine lectures, the first of which addresses sun angles which are addressed in various visualizations. This is an equatorial and a polar view of the Earth with uh, winter equinox and summer sun angles shown for a 30 degree latitude. This is what those sun angles would look like if we plotted them on the surface of the Earth. 
Here's what the uh, summer and winter look like on a horizontal aperture. You'll notice that the winter sun angles are at a shallow angle. The summer sun angles are at a steeper angle relative to this aperture. And also there are more hours of the day during the summertime. We have solar data to back all this up to help in the understanding of the students. So each of these specs represents a 10 minute time average. This is all the 10 minute intervals of June all the 10 minute intervals of December. You'll notice the June day is much longer. We're missing some hours at the beginning and the end of the day during winter time. Um, but also because of the angle effects, the intense beam sunlight around midday is really fierce in June, not so strong in December. There's almost three times as much light and heat incident on this aperture during the summertime as during the winter time which is the exact opposite of what we would like to have from both a thermal and psychological point of view. This is an example. This is a skylight structure that just basically connects all that sunlight. In this building, uh, the air conditioning system drones on so loud almost all months of the year that it becomes a constant distraction as the air conditioning system tries to keep the building cool. This is a little more of what we have in mind, and we'll talk about that some more later on. Um, other orientations can be even worse than horizontal. North-facing tilted glass gets no beam sunlight during the wintertime and gets beam sunlight during the summertime from the very first moment that the sun rises. So if we look at the solar data for that in the month of June and in the month of December, we get about seven times as much light and heat incident on that north-facing tilted aperture as we get on the month of December. So we encourage our students to look at things more like this. North-facing glazing provides steady glare-free light in most locations. South-facing glazing with protective overhangs also works very well, assuming that measures are taken to protect the occupants from direct beam sunlight. We talk about where apertures should be located and how far apart they can be spaced. We give some geometric uh, guidelines for how to construct a, a cross section so that fairly uniform light is achieved. Students do uh, detailed CAD drawings where they account for things like the height of the curb, the thickness of the roofing insulation, the thickness of all structural elements, and so forth. These have to be drawn to scale we put students through certain exercises where they have to uh, copy a certain cross-section and make modifications to it. So all that's done much more easily in CAD than it is on a drawing board, and it just cannot be done properly on Illustrator unless the students want to tear their hair out. So this assignment, the students are supposed to pick their building type, figure out what the spans are involved. They're given a rubric for the grading, uh, which they can keep as a checklist for the issues that they need to be addressing. Some of the student output, um, this is a structure based on um, a type of modified bow truss. Here's one based on a steel rigid frame with long cantilevers on both sides. Here's one with glue lamb arches in a gothic shape. Here's a structure with steel trusses supporting the roof and then lateral stability. Uh, this would be the south facade. Lateral stability in the north-south direction is achieved by the diaphragm action of the roof and the shear walls. And lateral stability in the east-west direction is achieved by the moment connection between these deep spandrel beams and these columns. In the early stages of this assignment, we got some models that were strikingly flawed. Um, in this model, the corrugated roof decking is spanning in this direction. It's being supported by these small beams, which we call purlins. Um, these purlins are in the same direction as the corrugated decking, which we never do. The corrugated decking was designed to span with the corrugations running perpendicular or running between the support structure. So, here we have this problem that the corrugated decking doesn't have the right orientation relative to the structure supporting it, but also the structure supporting it has horrible proportions. 
This was supposed to be a model that roughly simulates a steel structure. Uh, those beams would need to be at least L over 28 deep, but they're actually more like L over 60. And this flaw is dramatically illustrated by the droop in this roof. Um, another problem here is that this wall is not well supported. This was a common flaw in student designs early on. Here we have a truss that's very weak against forces perpendicular to the plane of the truss. We have a wall that's very deep against forces perpendicular to the plane of the wall. The two of those meet at the center here effectively in a hinge. So there's no way this wall structure can span from top to bottom. It has to span all the way from side to side and the wall was nowhere near thick enough to do that. So we, got a, we now have a large collection of these highly flawed projects uh, which allow us to illustrate to each incoming group of students the kinds of issues that we're going to be looking for and the kinds of mistakes that they should try to avoid. In addition to those flawed models, we have some that are beautifully executed, um, such as this one, with all the members required for resisting all vertical forces and all horizontal forces in all directions, with all those members having spans and proportions consistent with the guidelines. And the day laying apertures are properly located and sized. So these are all the key topics, the conceptual key topics that we talked about that were addressed under the uh, initial foray into structural design. That took up the first half of ARC 331 and then the rest of ARC 331 and 332 are a bit more analytical in nature where we try to establish an analytic um, understanding of how our guidelines came about. So we're going to look at properties of materials, fabricational methods and processes, uh, identifying design loads and applying the loads to the structure, tracing forces through a structure, sizing tension members, sizing compression members, applying span tables, load tables, and sizing procedures to size most of the structural types that were addressed in the guidelines for spans and proportions and in the process verifying those guidelines and giving deeper insight into the meaning of the guidelines. We're going to be using spreadsheets to organize and carry out computations, using computer simulations to creatively explore structural behavior. We're going to be exploring tectonics and connections and also codes and standards. That concludes our overview of ARC 331 and ARC 332 Architectural Structures 1 and 2.